Okay, I've got the time is 216. So I think that means it's time to get started. Thank you so much everyone for joining us for our second and final press conference of the day. Today, Tuesday, June 14th at 2.15 p.m. here in Pasadena, California. I am Carrie Hensley. I'm the AAS Deputy Press Officer. And joining me today are Susanna Kohler, the AAS Press Officer, and Haley Wall, our AAS Media Fellow, over here at the table to my right. Um, I'd like to ask you all to silence your cell phones if they aren't already or anything else that might make noise. There will be several press releases distributed. Um, I think we have one press release for each of today's presenters, so be on the lookout for those on the usual AAS channels. They'll also be posted in the AAS press conference Slack channel. Um, as I mentioned this morning, our previous day's recordings are up on the AAS press office YouTube channel, so you can check them out there if you missed anything this um, missed anything yesterday, and the press kit has also been updated with those press releases and links to the present, uh, presenter slides. So to briefly go over how this is gonna work here today, we have um, five presentations and we're going to have each of the presenters speak in order with no time in between for Q&A. And once we've heard from all of our presenters, we'll have group Q&A and people in person as well as watching on Zoom will have the opportunity to relay their questions to the presenters. So this afternoon's press conference is entitled Galactic Neighbors and Insights from Alma. That is the, if you somehow don't already know the name of this extremely famous, famous and productive array, that is the Atacama Large Millimeter and Submillimeter Array. So we've got a wide variety of science all to do, or not all to do, but involving galaxies and um, results from ALMA. Our first, first speaker will be Katya Gosman from the University of Michigan, speaking on an extragalactic fossil record, M94's merger history through its stellar halo. Following will be Eric Bell, also from the University of Michigan, speaking on building out the census of faint and ultra faint satellites of Milky Way mass galaxies new satellites of satellites in the M81 group. Then we'll have a joint presentation from John V. Madhani and Charlotte Welker from the Johns Hopkins University, answering the question or approaching the question, are planes of satellite galaxies as elusive in simulations as previously thought? Our final in-person speaker will be Hollis Aikens from Grinnell College speaking on um, Alma revealing extended cool gas and hot ionized outflows in a distant star forming galaxy. And our final presentation this afternoon will come from afar from Ambesh Singh at the University of Arizona speaking on Alma revealing the molecular outflows in the ejecta of VY Canis Majoris. So I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to our first speaker, Katya. All right, hello everyone. I'm going to be talking about an extragalactic fossil record or M94's merger history through its stellar halo. Uh, my name is Katya. Uh, I'm a rising third year graduate student at the University of Michigan. I work with Eric over there. Uh, yeah, so first thing I wanna do is talk just a little bit about galaxies. So galaxies evolve and grow through mergers. And when you think of two galaxies merging, you might think of images such as these. These are two of the most famous examples of galaxies that are currently undergoing very obvious merger events. But distinct mergers like these are hard to catch and they happen over a time scale about billions of years. And so we can't actually watch them happening. And after merger is complete, we also can't tell just by looking at a picture of the galaxy what kind of merger it underwent, you know, whether it was big, small, how long it took, et cetera. Um, and so even though these events are pretty difficult to watch and later detect, mergers do leave behind a record. And you could call this a sort of archaeological record that we can measure. And so this video here is a uh, simulation done by the illustrious TNG group that simulates the formation of a late type disk galaxy. And this video is going to be sped up. But uh, look what happens when this primary galaxy over here collides with the secondary smaller galaxy 
uh, down here. Um, so notice that as the two galaxies merge and sort of dance around each other, the stars of the secondary galaxy are flung out and dispersed around the outskirts of the primary. So while in real observations, we can't see this happening in real time, we posit that the remnants of merging galaxies are retained by that primary galaxy in what we call its stellar halo, which is the very outer part of the galaxy. And so for you to kind of get a sense of size and scale of a galaxy stellar halo, take a look at this galaxy. So this is M94, a relatively nearby spiral galaxy that I studied over the last two years. Um, this image is just a mosaic that I stitched together courtesy of SDSS. And now the visible part of the galaxy here is only about a tenth of a degree across. So that is a tenth of the size of your pinky finger if you held it out at arm's length in the sky. But the galaxy stellar halo is enormous compared to this. So in this rightmost image here, the visible portion is only a very tiny portion in this image and all of this area here, green box, all of this around it is a stellar halo, which is extremely faint. And in fact, resolving individual stars in the stellar halo takes super powerful instruments such as this one. Uh, so this is a picture of the super telescope and it has a camera called the Hyper Supreme Cam, which is an insanely powerful imager that can actually resolve individual stars in the stellar halo of these nearby galaxies. And by using this, we can study these stars and use them as a sort of fossil record to learn more about the merger history of our neighbors. And in studying that merger history, we want to be able to use this to see if we can learn something about the internal structures of galaxies. So these are three uh, examples of well known nearby galaxies. And what I've circled here in purple are their central structures that I'm referring to. Uh, we call these bulges or pseudo bulges, depending on the motions of the stars. And they're basically just a conglomerate of stars centrally concentrated within these galaxies. And out of these galaxies, M94 is especially interesting to us because it actually has the largest pseudo bulge of any galaxy in our local universe. It's about 50% of the entire stellar mass. And this is also a galaxy that has never had its stellar halo resolved before. And so the data I'm gonna to present to you is the first look that we have had at this galaxy stellar halo. So from resolving stars uh, in the halo, measuring its surface brightness, um, we learned that its stellar halo is not massive at all, and it's pretty metal poor, meaning it doesn't have a lot of heavy elements, anything heavier than hydrogen and helium. So this picture on the left is a false color RGB map that I made by taking stars of various metallicities, combining them into one. And you see that this entire dispersed blue region right here, this is the halo of the galaxy, and this is quite metal poor compared to this more concentrated red ring in the inner disk of the galaxy. This is marked by more metal rich stars in the center here. And from this information, we also inferred based on past studies that M94's dominant merger was about a galaxy three times smaller than that of a nearby dwarf galaxy in our local group, the small Magellanic cloud right here. And so this lets us infer that M94 had a very quiet, quiescent merger history so far. And we can also compare M94 to other nearby local galaxies in terms of our central question. So here is a plot. And on the y-axis, uh, this tells us how massive each galaxy's bulge or pseudo bulges, that central structure that I was referring to. And on the x-axis, you can kind of think of this as a proxy for how active a merger history a galaxy had. The smaller the halo, the less active, the smaller the mergers a galaxy underwent. Um, and so I just wanna highlight here, these are some examples of stellar halo maps that have been made for other local galaxies and they're in order of active merger history. So in pink, we have M94, really small halo, didn't have a super active merger history. Uh, then we have M81 in lilac, um, which was done by Adams Mersina, and it's actually already undergoing in the process of merging. And then lastly, in dark purple, M31 has a humongo halo, 150 kiloparsecs. Um, it's already undergone a large merger in the past. Um, and so by looking specifically at these red galaxies here, these pseudo bulges, um, we see a uh, difference, a big discrepancy here between, for example, M101 and M94. These two galaxies have uh, really similar merger histories, 
but really different central structures, right? And same thing on the x-axis, right? M94's um, bulge is about the same mass as like say these galaxies over here, but the merger history was completely different. And so from that, we posit that its dominant merger most likely didn't have a major role in the growth of its enormous pseudo-bulge. So just a quick summary, M94 stellar halo uh, is very metal poor, very tiny. It's had a pretty quiet merger history so far and nearby galaxies are very diverse in terms of both merger histories and central structures. So it's massive pseudo-bulge probably didn't arise due to its dominant merger. And so this has added a very significant data point to our knowledge about the evolution of local galaxies since studying them is so difficult and resolving stars takes really powerful telescopes. Yeah, thank you. All right, so um, I appreciate uh, having the opportunity to tell you about some work that uh, my collaborators and I have been doing, uh, trying to reveal uh, galaxies a million times fainter than the Milky Way in the Messier 81 galaxy group. This is work done with Adam Smirsina and Paul Price, and also I'll catch you at the end of the table. So why do, why do we care about these little tiny galaxies? The basic idea is that simulations, right? We have these dark matter simulations which predict hundreds of clumps of dark matter around galaxies like our own. Dark matter is transparent, so it looks like this, right? So we're a wee bit stuck and we need to figure out a way to try and understand it. And so what you try to do is you try to find the tiny galaxies that live in the center of many of these dark matter halos. It's our only way of learning about them. Now we know about these galaxies basically in only one place down to really faint limits, the Milky Way, around the Milky Way. Um, this galaxy, if you looked at it in the sky, would be invisible. So what um, Vasily Balokharov and Sergei Kopasov did was they just took the stars that are in this dwarf and they just made them 100 times brighter so you can see it. But you, you looked at this piece of sky, you'd see nothing there. This is the kind of galaxy we're looking for. It's not visible, it's just a little clump of stars. And so we've been looking to try and increase this census from the Milky Way or potentially Milky Way and Andromeda to other galaxy groups. Uh, and so we use, uh, again, uh, Subaru's Hyper Supreme Cam. I mean, there's a reason why uh, both Katya and I have used it is because it is the best instrument on the planet for resolving stars uh, in, in nearby galaxies. Um, this is the Subaru telescope for those of you who haven't thought about it much. It's uh, an eight point something, I actually forget, uh, diameter primary. Uh, that's me uh, for scale. In the bottom, this was taken by Adam Spursina when we were observing together. Uh, and Hyper Supreme Cam is actually this thing up here. And so it doesn't look like much because you're far away from it, but it's bigger than I am, right? It's considered, it's, you know, you big. Uh, it's, it's a good ton and a bit. So we've been using this instrument. It's amazing. It's, I mean, you can actually use this. It's fantastic. Um, to look around a nearby Milky Way mass galaxy called uh, Messier 81. Uh, it's, you know, Messier 81 is this big guy in the middle. It's more or less like the Milky Way. And it has a couple of large satellites around it. This is an image from Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, if we zoomed in a lot and spent uh, a considerable amount of eight meter telescope time on it. This is what one of the fields looks like. And so it's filled uh, with uh, mostly tiny unresolved galaxies, right? So most of these are extremely distant galaxies, billions of light years away. Um, now, if you are careful about selecting things that uh, appear consistent with stars at the distance of the M81 group, uh, and you're equipped with a magical red marker, you can circle uh, the, the objects that appear to be both point-like and consistent with the colors and brightnesses of the stars at the distance of M81 groups. So it allows you to get rid of or not consider all of these distant galaxies and instead really focus on the clumps of things that we think are stars. So let's remind you of what the M81 group looks like. We're trying to find clumps, highly statistically significant clumps of stars. Um, 
This map looks a little grotty. Uh, my apologies. This is hard work. Uh, so I'm actually showing you kind of what the maps look like that we're recovering galaxies from. Uh, this purple area, the inside of the purple area is where we have a little better data than the outside of it. Um, this is the M81 galaxy. If you kind of go back, it's like, oh, look, you know, that's M81. They have the two big satellites. Uh, you see big envelopes around them where they're being tidally disrupted. But the thing I actually want you to pay attention to are things like this. And you'd be like, Eric, there's nothing there. It's like, well, there's actually a little tiny clump of stars. And so we're trying to find statistically significant clumps. And so when we do this um, in yellow-ish, which doesn't come through super duper well, um, we have all the known galaxies in the M81 group. Uh, in brick red is the uh, is one definite dwarf where we're you know hand on a heart certain, uh, and then the other ones are candidates um, for ultra faint uh, companions of M81 group. So just to kind of zoom out back to the the overall picture of the M81 group, uh, I want to show you what a couple of the dwarves look like. Right, the one that we're certain of, you're certain of it because you can bloody see it, right? You can just say, <laughs> like, oh, look, it's got diffuse surface brightness. It's a clear dwarf galaxy. These other ones are so diffuse that you basically see through them a lot like the satellites, the Milky Way. Uh, and so this is what we expected to see. It's like, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, as you see, you see nothing, right? But that was the idea, is you see a little clump of stars, but you more or less see through it. So to remind you of what we were kind of expecting, right, or the big idea, dark matter halo, you have little subhalos. So you expect to see them clumped around the main galaxy. You may or may not have realized, it's like, uh, Eric, they're off on one side. And that was a really surprising thing about all of this, is that instead of being clumped around the big galaxy, they're actually all clumped around the bottom, around this much smaller galaxy. It's, it's like a large Magellanic cloud analog. It's a factor of 10 uh, less massive than the big guy. We don't know why Messier 81 doesn't have many of its own satellites. This big galaxy is basically toxic to be around. It either destroys the satellites or it stops them from forming to begin with. And that means that then all of these new satellites that we discover are basically new deliveries um, uh, to the group. And so you can tell that because they've come in, they haven't had time to spread out in the group as would happen over billions of years. I know that seems like a lot of time, but it's kind of short for astronomers. Um, and it hasn't had time to spread out. So to summarize, using the Subaru telescope, we've discovered uh, seven tiny galaxies up to a million times fainter than the Milky Way and amongst the least luminous galaxies ever found outside of a local group. Uh, one's a definite satellite, six are candidates that we'd really like to be a little more certain about, but you can tell why this is hard work. Uh, and the satellite distribution is is not what we expected. It's clearly asymmetric, which is telling us about how uh, the big galaxies get satellites mostly by stealing them from little guys. They steal their lunch money. Um, so I, I will leave it at there and thank you for your time. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John B. Madhani. I'm a second year PhD student at Johns Hopkins, and this is my co-author, Dr. Charlotte Welker. She's a postdoc at Johns Hopkins, and currently we're studying the formation of planes of satellite galaxies in order to resolve a small-scale tension with our model of cosmology. So when we point our telescopes towards local galaxies, starting with our very own Milky Way and including our nearest neighbors, Andromeda and Centaurus A, Astronomers observe thin streams of satellite galaxies orbiting around these host galaxies. And as you can see in this cartoon figure, we see smaller individual galaxies preferentially aligning, aligning themselves around these more massive host galaxies. These alignments are also kinematically coherent. And what this means is that half of the satellites are moving towards us and the other half are moving away from us. And in this color scheme, blue represents satellites moving towards the observer and red or pink represents them moving away from the observers. So these satellites are co-orbiting in the same plane. And at first, this might not seem strange and maybe we can come up with some dynamical stories to explain why we see such thin planar alignments. 
that are also moving very coherently. But the problem is that even though we observe these planes around nearly every local galaxy, we rarely find them in simulations. A simulation is kind of like a numerical laboratory in which we can test our theories of physics. And past simulations have predicted that these satellites should be much more randomly distributed around the central galaxy. And these simulations are finding that planes that are comparable to observation only exist in about 2% of Milky Way type galaxies. Whereas, as I mentioned, in observation, we're seeing them nearly everywhere. So what's happening here? What we're observing does not match what we are theorizing. And these two have been at odds with each other for the past several decades. And this tension puts into question not only our model of cosmology, but also our model of gravity. So we attempt to solve this question by using a next generation simulation that resolves fine details over a large volume of the universe. So here is a movie of the simulation that we use called New Horizon by Dubois et al. Um, and here, what you're looking at is in blue, you can see the cold gas. And then the bright white spots are the individual galaxies. And the red to yellow regions represent the hot bubbles of gas being blown out of the galaxies from either supernovae or black holes. And within this region, we have about 5,000 galaxies and about a dozen Milky Way type galaxies. So using this next generation simulation, we're very excited to say that we find planes of satellite galaxies in about 30% of Milky Way type systems. So this is enough to actually explain why we see so many planes in the nearby universe, and we no longer have to abandon our model of cosmology or adapt a new theory of gravity. So I'll let Charlotte explain a little more. Thank you, Janvi. Okay, so what did we do different in this simulation? Well, as Genvi uh, explained, not gravity. Gravity is taken into account in the same way as in any other simulation and using very, the very standard model of gravity. So the difference has to do with the specifics of the simulation itself. So in particular, we have a very high resolution, which means that we do see a lot of details. For instance, when you focus on the galaxy, you can see the spiral arms, you can see some clumps. So we have really, really fine details. And it, it allows us to also recover this population of dwarf satellites around each big galaxies very precisely. So that's the first thing, but that's not the only thing because result simulations already exist. Another big difference with our simulation is that the, this resolution and fine details is not just around galaxies. It's, it's not just in these little circles around one galaxy. It's over a large volume, a large part of the environment in which all these galaxies are embedded. And this is what uh, is represented by this white circle. Within this white circle, we have very high resolution, not just for the galaxies, but also for the environment. And you can see that it makes quite a difference. For instance, you can see this zine thread in pink. This is a zine stream of gas, what we call a cosmic filament. And because we have this resolution, you can see the zinness of uh, this stream, and you can see all uh, the details of how it mixes with other streams, for instance. Outside of the white circles, that's what we would have without this high resolution. And as you can see, uh, the features of the environment are very smudged over, they're very smooth. We don't really see much details. So all the interactions between galaxies in this kind of environment is lost when you do not have a high, high resolution into the environment. Uh, so we think that the main difference is really combining these very fine details across a very large volume. Um, and the reason why we were able to do that is because uh, our computing capacity have increased and we can now use uh, more than 60 million CPU hours, 60 million hours of computing time to run these simulations by running them on many processors at the same time, so more than 5,000 in, in that case. So, uh, this is how we managed to have these simulations and how we managed to have all this interaction between galaxies and their environment. And so in conclusion, 
well, the good news is that maybe we do not need to modify your model of gravity after all. We do find planes with standard gravity, but perhaps even more interesting is the fact that we definitely need to better understand the fine interactions between satellite galaxies or proto-satellite galaxies and their cosmic environment, the environment they are born in. So this is what we're focusing on now. We have another project and going uh, specialize in that, so uh, stay tuned. Thank you very much. All right. Um, my name is Hollis. I am uh, just finished up my undergraduate degree at Grinnell College in Iowa, um, and I'll soon be starting my PhD at UT Austin. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about some work that we did using ALMA, revealing an extended cool gas feature and hot ionized outflows in a really distant star forming galaxy. This is work that I conducted um, with a bunch of collaborators at the Dawn, Cosmic Dawn Center in Copenhagen. And you can see their names there. Oh no. All right, there we go. So I want to start by giving a kind of brief overview of the dynamic multi-phase interstellar medium. And so what I mean by that is that galaxies are not just stars. Um, the interstellar medium or the ISM is what we call all of the gas, mostly hydrogen, that makes it fills up the space between the stars. Um, this hydrogen gas is the fuel for star formation, so clumps of gas are constantly being formed into stars, and also stars are constantly dying and exploding in supernova and replenishing the ISM. This hydrogen gas also exists in many different phases. So if we were to zoom in on one little uh, region around a young star, we would see both cold neutral gas as well as hot ionized gas, these different energy states depending on the energy received from the star. Gas is also exchanged between the ISM and the circumgalactic medium, which is the large kind of sphere of gas around the galaxy in these kind of inflow and outflow processes. And so understanding how uh, galaxies evolve over cosmic time involves understanding how the gas in the galaxies evolve because that's the fuel for the star formation. And so in our study, we observed a very distant galaxy called A1689ZD1. You'll hear me say that name a lot. Um, this galaxy is roughly 13 billion light years away, meaning it gives us a glimpse into the very early universe just about 700 million years after the Big Bang. It's located behind this massive galaxy cluster called ABA1689. And so due to a phenomenon known as gravitational lensing, the mass of this cluster actually bends light around it and magnifies our galaxy by about a factor of 10, making it a lot easier to observe. This makes it a prime target for observations of the ISM. And this is particularly true because it's a relatively normal galaxy. It's not particularly massive or particularly bright, but we can observe it with real extreme depth because of this gravitational lensing. So we use data from ALMA, um, in observations of, uh, of oxygen and carbon. Um, uh, well, so despite coming directly from carbon and oxygen, we know that uh, these emission lines, which we call C2 and O3, um, they, they are indirect indicators of both the cold neutral and the hot ionized phases of hydrogen respectively. So that's these little maps that you can see on the bottom right. And then we also use archival HST imaging to uh, observe the ultraviolet emission from the starlight. So when we look at all these different components of the galaxy, we want to ask how the gas and the stars are distributed in the galaxy. And so we measure the brightness of these different uh, maps as a function of distance from the galaxy center. When we look at the stars, we see that they're pretty compact, extending only about 10,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. The same is true for the hot ionized gas, the, the oxygen emission. Um, this is about what we'd expect, because we'd expect this hot ionized gas to be found primarily where the star formation is going on. 
However, the cold neutral gas extends out to about 40,000 light years from the galaxy center, which is really puzzling because we wouldn't necessarily expect there to be such a stark difference between the cold gas and the hot gas in the stars. So there are a few possible explanations. And to, to kind of walk through that, we'll look at this artist illustration um, made by Bill Saxon at NRAO. Um, we can see in the illustration that you've got a, a kind of halo of this cold neutral gas shown in red surrounding a, a bright core of uh, hot ionized gas in yellow and then also the stars. So one possible explanation is that we have uh, mergers in the galaxy, kind of like Katya talked about earlier, that, uh, that these galaxies have been merging with smaller galaxies, and that kind of throws out a lot of the ISM material into the CGM. Another possible explanation is that we're observing outflows of gas driven by galactic activity, such as repeated supernova explosions or active galactic nuclei, the black hole activity in the center of the galaxy. These are things that have been observed in local galaxies, as well as in some distant galaxies. And with ALMA, we have actually have the capability to directly search for outflowing gas. This is because we can see matter that's moving at different velocities relative to us, as well as in different locations in space. So when we look at the very center of the galaxy, we see a spectrum for the cold neutral gas that looks about like this. It's kind of a smooth, normal distribution. Most of the gas is stationary with respect to the center of the galaxy, but some of it's moving at higher velocities. This is about what we'd expect for the thermal motion of the gas. When we look at the hot ionized gas though, we see a different kind of shape where there's a little bit of an excess of light moving at higher velocities relative to the center, about 200 to 400 kilometers per second. And that suggests that we're observing ongoing outflows of this hot ionized gas coming from the very center of the galaxy. So what does that mean for the extended gas in this galaxy? We think that, uh, we'll return to the artist's illustration, we think what's likely going on here is a sort of cooling outflow situation in which the gas starts at its outflow from the core where there's more activity going on in this hot ionized phase and cools to this colder neutral phase as it gets out to the further distances from the galaxy to form this extended neutral gas feature. So that's a temperature versus distance going down. So some key takeaways from this interpretation, if this galaxy A1689ZD1 is a representative galaxy at this early epoch of the universe, then these cooling outflows might be a critical part of the buildup of the CGM in many different galaxies. These results also tell us that this outflow activity seems to be able to shape galaxy evolution even in this very early part of the universe, not just in, late, in the later part of the universe, and even in relatively normal galaxies, not just in the biggest and brightest galaxies. So I'll leave my contact information up here on the title slide, and I'll hand it over to Ambesh. All right, everyone just sit tight for a few seconds while we switch over to our virtual presenter. Here's the part where I'm able to use the mouse without seeing it on my screen. Okay, Ambesh, you should be good to go ahead and share your slides. Um, can any, everybody hear me okay and see my slides? Um, we can definitely hear you. Yes, and now we see your slides. Great. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Amish Pratik Singh, and I'm going to talk about a peculiar group of star called hypergiants. So hypergiants are these rare massive star with masses between 20 to 40 times the mass of the sun. They were initially thought to explode as supernovae, but recent results have shown that their fate is not quite certain. Some of them actually collapse into a black hole without ever undergoing supernova. So we don't exactly know how these stars die, but during their life, they transition through this intense episodic and sporadic mass loss. This mass is launched from stellar surface in many directions, and it's very similar to the coronal mass loss of the sun only a billion times larger. The best example we have of hypergiant star is VYCMA. The figure to the right is the artist impression of VYCMA. So VYCMA is one of the most massive star known in our galaxy. It's 25 times the mass of the sun and it's 2000 times the size of the sun. 
It's about 4,000 light years away, and it's ejecting mass at an enormous rate. It has been known to eject mass at one of the highest rate of any star. And this mass loss is not symmetric, though. It's, it's forming all these complex structures like arcs, tails, and clumps, and creating a large, dusty, irregular envelope, like we can see in the figure to the right. So it reminds of us of uh, another star like Betelgeuse, which is visible with our naked eye. Um, the only difference is it's larger, it's twice as massive as Betelgeuse and twice as uh, large. So it's basically Betelgeuse on steroids. So in order to understand um, the molecular content of these kind of stars, we had conducted a spectral survey and we saw many carbon bearing molecules, which are exotic species like ALO, ALOH, and VO. We also detected a phosphorus containing molecule PO for the first time in this source before any astronomical sources. And these are the list of all the molecules that have been detected in the source. So VOIC may, um, besides being a massive star, was also very rich in molecules. But the true extent of those molecules were still unknown to us. And we also didn't know whether these molecules play any role in the mass loss events, like the kind we see with the dust. So then we decided to observe VYCMA with um, ALMA. With ALMA, we were able to create these molecular maps and then try to see find a pattern between the molecular map and the optical image that we, was given to us by Hubble Space Telescope. Upon comparison, what we see is the molecular outflow of molecules such as SO2 traces the same outflow as the dust and creates this similar large scale structure. This is more obvious when we overlay SO2 molecular map on top of the VYCMA optical image. And from this, we can tell that not only these large scale structures like arcs and knots present in the molecular map of SO2, they are also more prominent in the molecular map of SO2 than they are in the um, optical image that we have from Hubble Space Telescope. What this tells us is now we have a detailed velocity information of all these large scale structures that were associated with different mass loss events. This is very crucial to understanding how the mass loss itself happened and how these stars evolved into their later stages. I have a short video clip of the channel map of SO2. This is scaled by its velocity, so the color might change, the color might adapt to the um, emission pattern of SO2. So here it goes. So this, uh, what we saw was the outflow of SO2 and uh, swept, uh, swept along the different velocities or the frequencies that we are using to observe with ALMA. And this uh, outflow looks very similar to the artist impression of VYCMA that was made um, based on the Hubble Space Telescope image that we had. Other interesting molecules that we observed include HCN and PO. Um, both of these molecules had a smaller extent than SO2, but these are quite significant molecules biologically and BYCMA populates these molecules throughout interstellar medium as, as a way of losing mass. So compared to SO2, their extent is smaller and they are confined closer to the star, but not as close as NACL. NACL is con confined very close to the star and, but but it has a very interesting tail-like structure to its outflow. And when we overlay this tail-like structure of NACL on top of a one arc second small Hubble Space Telescope image, we find out that this tail is actually the Southwest clump that was previously identified um, on the Hubble Space Telescope optical image. And this clump was ejected about 230 years ago. With that, I would like to conclude my presentation by mentioning the following points. The most important points are molecules 
gas in gas phase trace the same kind of knots, clumps, and arcs as the dust does. And these are all, all these large scale structures are associated with different mass loss events. But with the molecular map from ALMA, we have a high resolution velocity information of unprecedented factor. And by combining the um, knowledge of ALMA molecular images, as well as the Hubble Space Telescope image, we can recreate the mass loss history of star like VOICMA and then use that information to ask larger questions like how these stars avoid supernova, how do these stars die, whether the mass loss events is very similar to the coronal mass loss from the sun. So understanding the dynamics of the molecular envelope of VYCMA is very crucial to understanding the evolution of massive star like VYCMA, as well as understanding their fate on whether or not they evolve uh, to become a black hole. With that, I'll leave my contact information and I would like to thank my uh, PI, Dr. Lucia Juris, as well as my collaborator, Dr. Roberta Humphreys and Dr. Anita Richards for helping with this project. Thank you. <laughs> One moment. Where is Hannah? Oh, I think so. Oh, yeah, okay. All right. Oh, I can't see which one I can see. Ambesh, could I get you to stop sharing your slides? Thank you very much. Right. Okay, so now with that exciting transition, we're going to start our Q and A session. Uh, so for those of you, for those of you joining on Zoom, please use the Q and A feature um, in the Zoom window to queue up your questions. And for our Zoom attendees as well as our in-person attendees, please state your name, affiliation, and who your question is for. Um, so before we get the uh, Q and A started, we have a couple of people joining on Zoom. So uh, Lucy and Roberta, if you could briefly briefly introduce yourselves before we get started, that would be great. Lucy? Hi, I'm Lucy Zuries. I'm a professor of astronomy and chemistry at the University of Arizona, and I'm OnBase's research advisor. Thank you. Hello, uh, this is Roberta Humphreys at the University of Minnesota. I have done a lot of work on VY Canis Majoris and collaborating with Lucy and Ambesh on the ALMA observations. Great, thank you both so much. All right, let's start with some uh, in-person questions here in the room. Let's see what happens. <laughs> All right, I'm on. That's very loud, sorry. I'm Monica Young, I'm with Sky and Telescope. Um, my first question is for um, Katja Gosman. Um, I was wondering about the um, M94, um, you said it was not, the bulge was not created by a merger. And so I was wondering, I think the only other option then is that it accreted from just gas inflows, right? And so I was wondering if there, if you have any additional information um, about the environment that it lies in, like, can you see if it lies on a filament or see, the, see any sign of those inflows? I think you just need it to be really close. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, that's a great question. We sp we didn't study the inner portion of the galaxy because uh, the stars there are way too crowded um, in order to successfully resolve and pick out the individual stars. Um, but that is definitely something you could look at, I guess, if it's not merger. Um, it was probably, as you said, something, some sort of secular process, you know, just gas that has been falling in and creating um, the pseudo bulge in the center. But we don't know the exact mechanism by which it is formed. Oh. 
Uh, hi, this is Ethan Siegel from Starts with a Bang. This question is for Eric Bell. Uh, Eric, if I naively were to take something like the Hubble Extreme Deep Field and extrapolate what it saw over the entire sky, I'd get an estimate for the number of galaxies in the universe, but I know I'd be undercounting because I'm not getting the faintest, the smallest ones. I've seen theoretical structure formation simulations that make estimates of how many galaxies do we believe there are in the observable universe? You have data. You've been finding the tiniest dwarf, irregular, diffuse galaxies around not only galaxies in the local group, but galaxies nearby and around there. If we instead were to make estimates for the number of galaxies in the universe based on the recent discoveries that you and other teams like yours have made concerning satellite galaxies, what do we learn? Can we come up with a superior, superior empirical estimate for the total number of galaxies all the way down to the faintest, smallest ones ever seen? That's an awesome question. Um, I guess the answer is yes, one can do it. You may, you didn't ask, did I do it? And I'm, <laughs> I'm grateful for that because I didn't. Uh, naively, one may expect there to be at least 10 times more galaxies than, than you would see from, um, from just the counting. I'm imagining, we, we expect, um, especially in the, in the Milky Way, where we are super duper sensitive to very faint galaxies, there are probably about 100-ish little tiny dwarf galaxies almost none of which you would see. And so that's at least a factor of 10. I'm gonna guess it's probably something like a factor of 30-ish, more than the kind of counts from just the, the galaxies that we can actually see. But frankly, we don't know what the tiniest galaxies are or how many there are. We only see them in this little tiny bubble around the Milky Way. We don't see them in the rest of the universe. And so there's like a huge error bar, probably a factor of 10 on anything I say. Thank you. Hi, my name is Magdalene Austin. I'm with NITARP and my question is for um, Eric Bell. Uh, you, this is kind of a simple one, uh, good luckily for you. Um, so <laughs> my question is, you said that you had identified one hand on your heart certain dwarf galaxy and you had identified six candidates. How do you intend on furthering your research <laughs> and looking into those six candidates and maybe turning them into hand on your heart dwarf galaxies or not? Yeah, um, that, that's a question I've thought about a lot. I don't mind hard questions, I'm a scientist. <laughs> uh, if it was easy, we would have done it already. Um, so, so the easiest way to do it is to use Hubble Space Telescope or James Webb uh, to resolve stars that are substantially fainter. Um, and so then you'd end up with five to 10 times as many stars and you'd see this big old clump. If it was something else, you would see a clump of slightly resolved galaxies, for example, and it'd be really easy to say one way or the other. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Martin Ratcliffe, Freelance and Evans and Sutherland for Dr. Walker. Um, so it's the reason that the early simulations uh, not showing these planes of satellite galaxies because of the kind of simulation you were running like an adaptive mesh refinement that just follows the, the, the baryons and doesn't and kind of ignores the larger environment. Is that why? And if so, what kind of things in the future can we expect as we enlarge the kind of simulations that are being done with the newer techniques? And what are they? Thanks. So um, I, I think uh, if you look at historical perspective, every time we increase the resolution in the environment, we find new things. So, uh, and usually new things that we had not expected. You talk about the future, but I can tell you also about the present right now. So we do find the place, but um, even looking at a re simulation less resolved than that, the parent, result is, uh, the parent simulation from the horizon is called the horizon AGN. And uh, it's a much bigger volume, but with a lower resolution. And even in that case, when we tried rerunning this exact same simulation, but increasing also the resolution in the environment, a new population of that galaxy was discovered, compact uh, 
galaxies that had been missed so far. So uh, when we continue increasing resolution and better understanding the environments, the, the odds are that we are going to uncover new phenomena and new types of galaxies that we are currently missing. And that's uh, the kind of uh, things we're seeing here. Uh, processes that had been missed so far are now happening in this result simulation. Um, and I can't tell you too much more about what we are exploring right now, but uh, yeah, there, there are new, uh, new effects uh, at stake or same effect, but with more resolution that uh, suddenly give different results. Hi, this is uh, Ethan Siegel from Starts with a Bang again. This question's for Katya. Katya, um, when we, this is about the merger history of nearby galaxies. Um, you've sort of been able to draw conclusions about the merger histories of these galaxies from the populations in their stellar halos. I know another way that people look at the merger history of galaxies and try and reconstruct it is by examining globular cluster populations. What happens, what do we find when we examine globular cluster populations in these same galaxies where you compare galaxy mass with the properties of the stellar halo? Are the inferences from globular cluster population studies consistent with the conclusions you reach about the merger histories from studying stellar halos? That is a great question. And honestly, I am unsure about what, uh, if they match, you know, what, I'm, I'm unsure what the globular cluster studies have to say about that. Sorry. Uh, Monica Young with Sky and Telescope. This question is for Eric Bell. Um, I was just curious, you mentioned about the um, the environment of M91 being bad for dwarf galaxies. And I was curious if it was known like how quickly tidal disruption works to destroy a dwarf galaxy. Um, so that that's a terrific question. And so I, I think the part that really confuses me about all of this is that tides is just gravity, which is incorporated spectacularly well in our models of um, galaxy formation. So, um, you know, to give it, to give a benchmark, the really early simulations of uh, dwarf disruption by big galaxies, you'd have a hundred galaxies fall in and only 10 survive to the present day. Um, and so tides are an incredibly destructive process for dwarf galaxies. And so this is one reason why it's possible to imagine, well, if the satellite population was a little different, maybe it was a little more fragile, like it was more extended or puffy, um, if it passed a little closer to the galaxy, you may end up producing pretty big differences. So even though it doesn't come out the models, this is one reason why we think it's possible. Um, but it's, it's, it's early days and we don't really know. I think it's with work like this and with doing the modeling attached to this, which is really hard work and takes time, that we'll hopefully learn about something we'd have to do differently to adjust uh, how we've been modeling the, or the types of galaxies that are in the dark matter halos, how close they get to, to do a better job of the tides. Okay, I have a question here from Rick Lovett, freelance. A question for those of you using ALMA. How has it increased our overall ability to study fine structure near and far in the universe? That is, how do you assess its overall impact? Okay, I'll go first then. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so uh, it definitely helps uh, looking at the large scale structures, especially when some things uh, cannot be easily resolved. The smaller scale structure where things cannot be easily resolved from the, you know, in a complicated star sources like BYCMA, uh, we wouldn't have been able to identify all these um, arcs and knots and all these different structure had it um, if, if we weren't using this uh, if, if we weren't using the resolution that we picked to look at this star 
So the improved mainly resolution definitely helps seeing um, the large scale and the small scale structures. And we picked different resolution to uh, pick out different uh, side structures for in our source. Uh, yeah, I can, wow, mine's loud. Uh, I can echo what Ambesh said a little bit about the resolution. In our study, we were targeting, looking for this like large scale feature around the galaxy. And so having lower resolution maps was actually really important to, to highlight the like, maximize the sensitivity for that large scale structure. But also for other studies, even studies going on with this same galaxy, A1689ZD1, you want really high resolution so that you can uh, model like the very, the, you know, structure of the gas in the very center of the galaxy. And ALMA allows you to do both of those uh, sometimes simultaneously, but also in kind of par in, in different observations. I'd also say ALMA has become very useful for studying galaxies in the very, very distant, very early universe um, because of these far infrared emission lines, C2, O3, N2, on and on, um, and allowing us to really map the, the physical state of the ISM um, in multiple, you know, these multiple emission lines and uh, in multiple galaxies. And so bef until JWST data, <laughs> um, it's, it's really the way to, the, been the way to, uh, to investigate these early galaxies. All right, I think we have time for one more question. If anybody in person or online has one. All right, going once, going quick, Rick. <laughs> Thanks, Rick Feinberg from the AAS and Sky and Tail. Uh, this question is for Eric, though. Uh, assuming that the candidate dwarfs that you found are dwarfs, how do the numbers of candidates at the brightness levels that you found compare with the predictions from the cold dark matter model? Okay, um, this is, uh, I actually should have shown the plot, I'm sorry. Um, so, Maybe I'll do this differently, right? Because it's called dark matter models, of course, just dark matter, which is transparent. So what we do is we calibrate our models to look like the Milky Way or Andromeda. And the shape, so the kind of number, as you get fainter and fainter, that number grows. The trend line uh, looks just like the trend line of Andromeda or the Milky Way, only higher. There's a lot of galaxies um, above this brightness, this kind of threshold brightness of 50,000 solar luminosities um, within the central 100 kiloparsecs, which is 300,000 light years ish um, of the M81 group. And that's more or less double that number in Andromeda or the Milky Way. So it's, I guess, it's consistent in the sense that the shape uh, of that growth curve is, is consistent from galaxy to galaxy. What's surprising is the number's a little high, and boy, they're all off on one side. Does that help? Cool. Uh, great, thank you to everyone for your excellent questions. Let's give our presenters one last round of applause as a thank you for their great science. Thank you so much to everyone who joined in person as well as online. And especially thank you to the PIOs who worked so hard to get their press releases ready for this press conference um, and to our sponsor USRA, of course. Uh, we certainly hope to see you tomorrow morning at 10.15 a.m. PDT for our next press conference on stars, their environments, and their planets. Thank you so much.